All righty, let's get started. Thank you so much for coming to the hangover slot. I hope that you're all not feeling too rough after last night. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm presenting a talk called High Tech Delight, and uh, that's going to delight is going to be a pretty big theme throughout this entire talk. Um, so the subtitle is Programming the Hard Out of Hardware. So I'm going to be focusing on a lot of open source hardware libraries and the specific hardware ecosystem that I'm in, in the open source world, which is JavaScript hardware. You might not think that JavaScript, um, it may not be the first language that comes to mind when you think about robotics and electronics and hardware and things like that, but I wanted to tell the JavaScript hardware story a little bit today, and I'm hoping that some of the uh, case studies and stories that have come out of this will inspire you to think about the way that you write software for other developers. A little bit more on the agenda is um, open source hardware, as I mentioned, making other developers happy and writing better software. So my name is Suze Hinton. Uh, you can follow me on GitHub, Twitter, pretty much anywhere online um, at NoobCat or NoUpCat. Um, I'm not really fussy about the pronunciation. Uh, and I'm between jobs at the moment, so I'm just going to say that I'm an open source hardware dev. Um, but on Monday, I will be starting a new job as a tech evangelist for Microsoft, um, if that gives you an idea of where I'm heading next. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank NDC um, so much. I was, um, I was slotted to speak at NDC a couple of years ago, and the day before, uh, my partner had a bad fall and required emergency surgery. And I was supposed to run a robotics workshop and do a talk, and NDC were just incredibly gracious. Um, and were completely understanding about it and offered to help out even. Um, and there were amazing enough to ask me back to speak at NDC London this year, so just amazing, um, amazing organizers that treat you very well. And a funny note on that is <laughs> just a couple of days leading up to me flying out, I actually fell down the stairs. Um, so I have a sprained ankle at the moment, and the first thing I thought when I reached the bottom of the stairs and was just sitting there blinking was, oh my god, I have to go to NDC, I can't cancel on them again. So I'm very happy to be here, and um, thank you again to NDC for being such wonderful organizers. I'm also a member of the Node.js Hardware Working Group. Um, Node.js is a JavaScript runtime that runs outside the browser, and so you can do back-end server-side stuff. A lot of you will have already heard of it, but for those who haven't, that's what it is. And Node.js has an enormous contributor community, and we're broken into lots of different working groups. And so I'm specifically part of the hardware working group because uh, as a group, we're working towards getting um, serial access and things like that as first-class citizens, hopefully in uh, the runtime eventually. Uh, but for now, we're focused on getting the community um, in the Node.js scene less scared of trying to do cool stuff like electronics um, and Arduino stuff with Node.js. I'm also a member of the Tesla 2 team. The Tesla 2 is a microcontroller that specifically runs JavaScript on it, and it has a wonderful um, first sort of five-minute setup guide, and I'll be talking a little bit about the Tesla community later on, so stay tuned for that. So as part of the Tesla 2 team, I just generally um, spread the good word, and I try to help out with open source, their open source repositories when I can. So a little bit of background um, on me and how I got into a lot of this stuff, and, and it does kind of explain why I care so much about developer experience. I've always been focused on this idea of delight, and so all of my hobbies in my spare time, whether it's hardware or whether it's other projects, I don't really think, is this going to be the next Kickstarter or is this going to be the next you know, big startup on TechCrunch? I just I don't care about that kind of stuff. What I want is to create something that either delights me or delights others or makes people think about using technology in ways that they might not have thought of before. And if you're having a lot of fun while you're programming something, you're, you tend to be learning a lot along the way too because it keeps you motivated. So I'm more focused on the human side of coding, and I wanted to show you a couple of projects that uh, I did that led me into crossing over to the other side and writing software for other developers. So these are called Meow Shoes. 
Um, <laughs> they are shoes with pressure sensors in them, and I made these for a fashion hackathon. And you can essentially hook them up to a computer, and you can report on whether the heels are pressed, the toes are pressed, or all of them are pressed. And you can write very simple algorithms to figure out whether someone is standing on one foot or whether they're dancing. And I ended up creating like a WebSocket interface to the browser that allows you to queue up music. Um, and so you can pretty much dance out a tune, and I had everything from meows, which is why they're called meow shoes, uh, which was a very annoying um, melody type, and then you could also pick things like instruments and percussion. So you could pretty much play the drums with your feet if you wanted to. Um, that went on to become quite popular, and uh, there's a book called Make JavaScript Robotics, and I wrote a chapter for that book, and that is featuring these meow shoes and how you can actually make them yourself. Uh, after that, I went on to attend a different hackathon this time. It was for AT&T, which is a really large uh, mobile co uh, telecommunication company in the US. And this is called the PER. You might be sensing a cat theme here. Um, the PER is the personal ultimate reassurance response. If you wear this bracelet, it monitors your pulse. And this was before a lot of the Fitbits and a lot of the fitness devices that came out that could uh, measure your pulse. So I used a pulse sensor and a Wi-Fi Arduino and um, 3D printed this bracelet. It was really odd when I took the 3D printer to the hackathon. People were mystified. Um, and I, I put this together so that if you have an elevated pulse for a certain period of time and you know, you're not exercising or anything like that, it will sense that you're probably experiencing a lot of anxiety or you're having a panic attack, um, and it will start texting you pictures of kittens. So it will uh, hit up the AT&T API, and then it will send you pictures of kittens saying it's going to be okay and giving you reassuring messages with those kittens. So that was super fun. Um, and you can see that I'm sort of focusing on not necessarily, like again, something that's going to make a lot of money and nothing that would be produced commercially, but that just makes people smile and makes people understand that technology can be used in lots of different ways. Um, this here is, wasn't actually complete, um, so you can see that there's a lot going on here. Uh, I have a Raspberry Pi connected to a, uh, just a battery so that it can be um, tetherless. And the Raspberry Pi is hooked up to a thermal printer, so you know the kind of receipt printers that you see in a lot of point of sales um, places. And what this does is it, it measures the uh, steps on your fitness device. And instead of you competing with your friends, um, what it does is it prints you your own adventure. And so it looks at how many steps and how much activity you did, and it still commends you for doing activity even if it's really low. And so that might sound like a cop-out, but the thing is there are a lot of people who, um, f because they're ill, they can't leave the house, or because they're, they're super busy or they're stressed out, um, they, they can't do a lot of exercise. And I think that the fitness industry is just super competitive and a little bit sort of aggressive, especially in America. And so I wanted to show that you can use a fitness device to tell a story for someone or make up a silly story. Um, this one says, around 5 o'clock, I see there wasn't a lot of activity from you. You did 22 steps. It's important to rest, so well done. I trust you were sitting on a lovely tree stump and a friendly dog trotted over to hang out with you. Uh, I also had ones such as, hey, you just did 1,200 steps, you know, between 4, uh, 4 o'clock and 5 p.m., I trust that you were doing your grocery shopping and a dragon started chasing you or a tiger started chasing you. And so people can kind of have these, these um, stories made up about them and then they can feel good about the fact that they were actually moving. Um, this here is a tribute to the Metro cards that you can get in New York. Uh, that's where I live. Uh, originally from Australia, but I moved to New York a few years ago. Uh, I wanted to create a custom circuit board, but not have it be just a classic custom circuit board. So I wanted to um, create something that was shaped like the public transport cards that you use to swipe through the turnstiles. And I wanted to use um, JavaScript in, and the Web Audio API to take sounds from the subway and then take that um, PCM sound data and turn it into um, a pleasant song because a lot of people don't like the sounds of the subway. 
And I ended up um, using JavaScript in the browser to do that, and then I flashed the um, audio back onto the uh, SD card of this particular circuit, and then when you hold the button down, you can hear that music playing. So you can kind of take that music down with you in the subway and, and, and just listen to it, translate it into music. Um, this is a, another project that I did recently. This is Angie the Anglerfish. And I put this circuit together um, for a tutorial in Recompiler magazine, which is a, a feminist tech magazine, um, trying to like, raise the voice of minorities in tech. And this was just showing that you can do something like, you can use a magnet to activate um, the anglerfish's light. And I sort of wrote up a, a tutorial on how to, how to do that. And that's just using a, a read switch, and I'm holding the magnet between my fingers. So as you can see, the, there's a big theme in a lot of the work that I do, and that's feelings. You know, I'm trying to elicit feelings from people. I'm trying to explore feelings. And I'm someone that just wants to make the world a better place, even if it's just making a couple of people smile. And so eventually, I, I saw people asking me all the time, how did I make all of these things? And I found that I got much more out of teaching others than I did out of actually making these things. And that's sort of where I started s switching over. And again, you're probably thinking, like, why JavaScript? Like, all, most of the projects that I just showed you, I did with um, Node.js, or I did something with JavaScript in the browser. Why was I so intent on using JavaScript? And the reason for that is I see JavaScript as a very universal language now. You can use it not just in the browser, but as I said, you can use it outside of the browser. You can use it in EC2 environments. You can use it anywhere that can run Node.js. You can even use it on a microcontroller, such as the TESOL 2. So it has a low barrier to entry. And um, Jen's talk yesterday was really awesome, where she talked about how coming into programming with JavaScript is a very common thing these days. And a lot of the time, it's the first language someone learns. And it's quirky. But because of that, it's very easy to learn. And, and as you said, you, you barely make mistakes with it because it's so forgiving. And so that's really great for people who want to learn robotic stuff, but they're even new to programming, which is something we see a lot in the JavaScript robotics community. Um, JavaScript is event-driven. And what I mean by that is when you think about robots uh, and sensors and things like that, if you're getting sensor data at intervals and things like that, that can be generated as a data event, right? And so JavaScript is so good at handling events that it just seems like a natural choice for this kind of thing. Um, and you know, this stuff is called like the Internet of Things, and JavaScript is associated with web stuff and the Internet, so it just seems like a nice little little uh, dovetail. So the community especially is much more the reason why JavaScript robotics is such a great thing. So it wasn't even necessarily just the technology enabling people. It's also the community. So has anybody heard of NodeBots? Raise your hand. Couple, awesome. Um, so the NodeBots community was spun up um, probably about five years ago now, maybe a bit more. And it started when uh, Chris Williams, uh, who is a JavaScript developer, wanted to use um, wanted to use Node.js with like ser the serial port. And in Python, that's really easy. You import serial, right? But that wasn't necessarily available for for Node.js at the time. So he created a module called serial port, and from there it just sort of exploded because you could do things such as communicating with Arduinos and and that kind of thing. And so that was a really, really exciting turning point for Node.js, in my opinion, even though I'm quite biased. Because from there, um, a man called Rick Waldron also wrote Johnny Five, which is homage to the, the movie uh, Short Circuit. And Johnny Five kind of sits on top of Serial Port and allows you to do really simple things and, and provides really nice abstractions for things like turning on LEDs and driving motors and stuff like that. And it's a really amazing library. And so I was kind of fiddling around with the Arduino with Flash Action Script uh, before Node.js came out. And you know, I had to proxy the serial port um, activity through a web proxy. And then um, I could use Flash Communication Server to use Action Script to then like, manipulate things in Flash using you know, knobs and dials and stuff plugged into my Arduino. And this just made my day because that stuff was so finicky. And so that's, that's sort of how I 
specifically got into NodeBots, but it's a wonderful community. Um, there is a really cool terminal tutorial that you can go through uh, that was written for Johnny5, and you don't even have to have any hardware plugged in. So imagine learning how to interact with hardware before you've actually even bought the Arduino, just to see if it's for you. And so this kind of simulates stuff um, while you're actually learning it, which is super, super fun. So this is just already a really great developer experience before we're even um, looking at some more deeper case studies. Um, I used to live in Las Vegas. It's a long story, <laughs> but I was there for four years. And I'm just in the front there, sort of towards the left, holding uh, a kitty butt, more cats. Uh, and this was the first international NodeBot stay that we ran in Las Vegas. And so I think it's July 27th to the 29th, depending on where, where Sunday falls on the calendar every year. Uh, but every year, the entire world gets together and holds an international NodeBot stay, and we all run a very similar workshop. And we have a very similar kit that we produce that's open source. And we are, and the, the man who made the, uh, the kit that's used worldwide is actually sitting next to me in that lovely rainbow check shirt. And we use this kit to teach people how to actually start doing this stuff. And so it's a little remote control car. Everybody gets to add their own flavor to it. So they spend half the day building the bot, and then they spend the other half of the day programming it. And the programming part is very important because the uh, round board that you see at the front is actually a sumo bot tournament, and so they compete against each other at the end of the day. And so here's a, a better close-up that I took of a lot of the uh, bots that were built. If you look really closely, you can see people got creative after lunchtime, and they stole the plastic utensils from their lunch kits <laughs> and created these, um, some, some of them, the offense strategies. So you can see that there is a, a windmill on the right, and there are some forks to try and scoop up robots and flip them over. Um, I just, I loved the strategy, and I loved how different every single robot turned out. I just love it. So that was an incredibly rewarding day. And uh, NodeBot Say Las Vegas continues to run, so I was there for the first two years, which was really, really awesome. And so you can already see that when you compare this to like the electronic engineering community, which aren't always super welcoming, this stuff is just really, really easy to access and, and cheap and, and very, very welcoming. So that made me feel really good, and I wanted to give back more to the NoBots community um, rather than just doing it once a year. I wanted to be part of the actual software side of it because it had given so much to me that I wanted to give back. And so I thought, okay, maybe it's time to start making tools instead of just making projects because projects are one-offs. But if you write tools, then um, you know so many more people can benefit from that, and it kind of you know kind of broadens from there. And so the first tool I wrote was for Johnny5, and it's called OLEDJS. And there's a cat on the screen. <laughs> but uh, the Johnny5 library didn't have support for these OLED screens, which are the screens that you see in your Fitbit watches or your Fitbit devices, and a lot of the other fitness devices use them. And they're very low power, so the power they consume is dependent on how many pixels are actually lit up at the time. So they're, they're super low power. You can do really neat things with them. But there wasn't support for them in Johnny5, and I wanted to do a project um, with the screens. And so I sort of reverse engineered a lot of the code and looked at the data sheet and um, wrote a Node.js library called OLEDJS that um, uses Johnny5 as like dependency injection. So it's not part of Johnny5, but it is a module that you can use. And I've seen that be forked and made compatible with the Raspberry Pi and made compatible with all sorts of other controllers, uh, microcontrollers, which was incredibly rewarding for me because I was like, oh, someone's actually using my stuff. This is awesome. And so I've seen robots that have faces and all sorts of stuff that people have shared with me. Um, someone made an Etch-a-Sketch with it. So they put two little knobs on the bottom and a reset button, you know, which is the equivalent of the shake and they managed to draw like tiny little pictures on the screen because the screen is only about this big. Um, so I thought that was really awesome. So then I went on to create a tool called AVR Girl. Um, that's the logo. It's, it's a little bit small on the screen. Um, AVR Girl is a riff on the tool AVR Dude. And if anyone's heard of AVR Dude, which I know is a weird name, 
Uh, it's a C package that allows you to take pre-compiled code and you can transfer it onto a microcontroller. So most microcontrollers are not powerful enough to run their own text editors. They don't really run an operating system. And so in order to um, write code for them to run on the devices, you write it on your computer and then you compile it and then you flash it onto the board. Um, and so there weren't really any um, centralized JavaScript tools that could flash the pre-compiled program onto like a broad range of Arduinos. There are a few packages out there that could do a few things, but it they were very, um, they were kind of very focused towards people that already knew what was happening with these microcontrollers. And so I wanted to create a an interface for people who don't really need to know about the details and just want the code to be put on there device. So I'm going to explore a couple of case studies from that library today. So you'll see a bit more of that, but that's a brief intro on what it's about. So case study number one on delighting your developer peers and writing better software for your developers. Let's have a look. So out of the box experience, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but I think that this, this is someone's first impression of your software. And so it's really important to have that awesome, you know, Christmas day, you open the gift and the batteries are included, which is just the best feeling. And so there are some software equivalents for that. And this is a diagram I, I wrote to try and explain how a computer and an Arduino can react. And they're sort of like, well, I, I don't know, maybe we can talk via USB. And, and so that's how AVR Girl works. You plug in your Arduino via USB. And there's a lot of other stuff going on underneath when you're doing things uh, with node bots. And so you still connect your Arduino to a USB connection, but there's all these different libraries that I've sort of visualized here. Um, there's node serial port, which is doing the connection. There's Johnny5 in the left corner, uh, which is running the robots. And then underneath Johnny5 is, uh, this, this bit's important, is a library called Fermata. And so Fermata exposes the Arduino as an API. And so you run this Fermata script, uh, which has been compiled on your Arduino. And then there is a Fermata.js library that can then talk to that uh, protocol. And so, for example, you just send one byte to turn on um, an LED on, connected to a certain pin, for example, or you can send really complex messages through protocols such as SPI or I I2C. So it, it does a lot, and all of this is abstracted away from the user so that they just plug in their uh, Arduino, they flash the standard Fermata code to their Arduino, and from there, Johnny5 is pretty much working out of the box once they run the sample script, the Hello World script. There was just sort of one issue with it, all of this, though, and, and it was getting the standard Fermata script onto the Arduino. So imagine someone might not have programmed before or they've only ever done front-end development or something like that, and they're coming in, and they're scared, and they're like, I don't know how to do robots, and we're like, it's cool, we've got you. So they come in, and we're like, all right, you have to download the Arduino ID, which is about 100 megabytes. You have to install it. You have to open the ID. At, at that point, they're like, why can't I just use Sublime Text, or I just want to use Vim, I don't understand what's happening. Then they have to open the standard Fermata um, sketch or script that comes with the Arduino software. They have to choose their correct board. They also have to find the correct port that their Arduino is plugged into. Uh, and then they click upload, right? So the, they're already like, what is going on? And then they just they close the IDE and they never open it again. And they're just like, uh, this took about half an hour to 45 minutes, depending on the, the um, internet connection, whether they're using Windows or Mac, and all of this stuff. And we're like, okay, cool, sorry about that. We promise that's the last thing you can now do your robots. And this was such a sticking point during a lot of the um, JavaScript robotics or the NodeBots workshops that I was doing that I was like, I just want to fix this so much. And that was a big reason why I did write AVR Go in the first place. It was these workshops that I had in mind. Because you want to take this face that people make and you want to like make sure that they don't feel like that. Because you know we can do better than that. Um, and so I used AVR Girl. Um, this is just kind of one of the CLI commands you can use. And so you just you say what board it is, which is a, an Arduino micro. You tell it what um, hex file or what compiled file you want to flash. And it even just automatically finds the port that your Arduino is plugged into. You don't have to tell it where it is, which you have to do for a lot of other command line apps that do this. 
um, and it tells you what it's doing, and then it lets you know when it's done. And so having to um, download the Arduino ID versus running one command is pretty good. Um, I, I would say it's an improvement. And then because flashing standard formata is such a common thing that we do uh, when we're teaching people this stuff, I went on to create another abstraction on top of that called Formata Party. And Formata Party ju just allows you to plug an Arduino in and then run Formata Party. And then you just say the name of the board that you have. So you use NPM, which is a JavaScript package manager, to install Formata Party. And then you just, it's a, it's a global app you know, in your bin and you just run it like that. And there's actually a party mode that someone pull requested me with. And the party mode is when you run it, you just press spacebar and it will upload standard formata. And so for a lot of workshop runners, they're just like swapping out Arduinos and they're preparing them the day before. And so a lot of people like to do that for their um, attendees. And they just keep hitting space and like just hot swapping all the, the Arduinos, which is really cool. So I thought that was awesome. And so now we have this really good script that we can run. For example, it would be npm run robot setup or something like that. And essentially, it just kind of walks you through stuff. And it says, hey, plug in your Arduino. OK, we're just going to like put the magic script on there. And you, know, you can learn about that later. But for now, we want to get you started. And then it says, cool, you're ready to do your robots. And that's just been a, a much nicer and faster experience. And if people only have a one-day workshop, that means that they've got almost, you know, like half an hour to 45 minutes more to actually spend on the fun stuff, right? And not feeling confused, especially if people are familiar with um, using Node.js already. This feels much more native to them, and it makes a lot more sense. So the lesson here is to create a magic first impression. Just make everything go smoothly, especially when developers don't know the technology or your software very well, because they're going to be the ones that feel dumb, like they're mucking it up. And the truth is, it could be just us providing a bad experience. And so we've all been there, where someone's blamed themselves, and we're like, no, 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 it's, it's really not you. And you know, they make this face, and it's really great. And I love it when people do that face. Cool. Case study two, when things go wrong. And they will, and they usually go wrong. Uh, so when you run AVR Girl Arduino, and you want to flash an Arduino Uno, if you don't have the Arduino plugged in, or sometimes if it's a weird um, a knockoff Arduino that has a different product ID or something like that, you will get this error. And it's a JavaScript error object, and it just has a string that says, no Arduino found. And that's very kind of a robotic error. And I find that every time I release new software, I'm worried that it might have broken something for some obscure board or something like that. And so I've had pull requests opened on my library when people have gotten this error exactly. And then I've had to kind of do this whole thing where I go through this entire process with them. And I'll say, OK, so is it an Arduino or a, like a genuine one, or is it a clone? Uh, this is what it looks like. Does the script work at all? But you know, like if you leave it as micro, but specify the port manually, and then if no, then can you run this script for me? And it's just. It's a lot of work for both myself and the person experiencing problems. And at this point, I'm just like, if my response is this long, then there's something wrong with this debugging process. And I also had this issue open for a while where I begged people to please test my software on all of the different weird boards that they have lying around. And again, like I had all of this, this entire description. It wasn't super helpful. It just says, successfully uploading a blink hex file is a great test to try. You know, here's a copy of it. And no one responded. No one really did the testing. And I realized that I was asking way too much of people. So I was expecting them to go through and find this issue and do the work for me and actually open an issue additionally if the board didn't work. And you know that, that was a lot for me to ask. And so you got to make helping fun. <laughs> and I learned that the hard way, for sure. So I created a hidden web app inside of AVR Girl Arduino called AVR Girl Arduino Test Pilot. And you can just run uh, avrgirl-arduino, and instead of writing flash as your command, you just run test pilot. And this browser just pops up out of nowhere and says, OK, like, let's do it. And it gets you to log in via GitHub so that you can um, get credit for testing. 
and it gives you some really easy steps. You plug in your Arduino, you choose what board it is, and you click Start Test. And then what it'll do is it'll try uploading just a simple script to your Arduino, and it will then provide a report at the end of that test. And so the report looks something like this. It has the username, the board, the operating system that um, the contributor was using, the uh, node version they were using, the version of the test application here, and then the version of AVR Girl. And if there were any errors, it will put the string of that error in there. Um, and if there were no errors, you can still submit the report because it lets me know that on a specific board and on a specific operating system that it works really well. And you can also remain anonymous, um, and, and, you, and you can also tick a box saying that you don't want me to reach out to you at all to like thank you or, or whatever like that. So there is a privacy policy um, on this application as well that you can read, and it just lets you know, you know what's going on. So that was really successful, and I've gotten a lot of people around the world just testing stuff for me, and someone wrote a blog post about it to encourage people to do it, and so I've gotten a lot out of this. Um, there's some really weird errors that you can get in the software, such as this one, which is flashed content length differs local 128 versus device one, and this seems like gibberish, and there's not even the correct spacing or casing in, in that error, and that came from an error of a dependency that I have and essentially, it was reading bytes back off the Arduino to verify that it matches the script that was um, supposed to be uploaded. And it wasn't reading the chunk size properly from Linux. And so I ended up going down a rabbit hole to fix this, and I ended up opening uh, a pull request on my dependency. And I now have push access to it, and I'm now accidentally the maintainer, which is what happens sometimes <laughs> when you open a pull request. But I got that fixed. and. That's awesome, and so that helped me so, so much, and I just couldn't figure out why some people had issues on Linux and some people didn't, and it's been pretty stable ever since. So the lesson here is make it easy and fun for others to help, and people will actually do it, and they get a kick out of it, and the reason why I, I get people's GitHub usernames is once they be become a test pilot, they get invited to the AVR Girl organization in the test pilot group. So they get to have that little GitHub badge on their GitHub page saying that they contributed to the AVR Girl project. So that's supposed to be like my gamification of uh, contributing. You get a little badge or a sticker at the end, kind of like I voted how you get that in America, which is cool. So people feel good about it, and they feel like they were part of a project, even if they were too shy to, to open a pull request, or if they just had no idea how to use Node.js hardware, they just kind of wanted to help the project in a certain way. That just made open source contributions a lot more accessible to people as well. So case study three, useful feedback loop. So we're gonna be talking about errors again. So AVR Girl has nine different types of errors. So nine things can go wrong in the process. One of them, as you saw, is you know it couldn't find the board. Uh, another one is just that yeah, it, the um, the program that got flashed onto the Arduino just when it read it back, it didn't match for whatever reason. Uh, there's lots of different things that can go wrong. Uh, the board didn't reset and come back online properly. Just sometimes stuff outside your control. So nine different types of errors. So if a developer is using uh, AVR Girl in one of their projects, which happens a lot, um, they have to kind of deal with these errors. And just for context, the kind of projects that AVR Girl is used on is things like an autonomous sailboat in Vancouver that is using a Raspberry Pi to up upload uh, updates to their Arduino over the air, which was kind of amazing. I didn't realize it was being used on an autonomous sailboat until recently. Um, the, there is a couple of 3D printers, actually, that have a web interface or a, an Electron app, which is a kind of a, an app that takes Chrome and puts a Node.js process behind it, and it looks like an app. So if you've ever used Slack before, Slack actually uses Electron. People were using uh, AVR Girl to just create really simple interfaces to their 3D printers that they were selling and things like that. And so like, when I find this out, I tend to pull down the software and look at how they're using it. And I also sort of see how they handle if things go wrong, such as, oh, we couldn't find the printer or whatever. And that's when I realized that the error handling or the, the way that uh, JavaScript errors are is not particularly helpful to users 
but it, we just kind of throw errors in Node.js if, uh, if something goes wrong. And usually it's just a string, right? And that's not super, super great, as you can imagine. And these are the classic JavaScript errors. You have an eval error, internal range reference, as we saw yesterday at Jen's talk, syntax type, and URI. It doesn't really feel like any of them match the Aviago errors that can occur. And so I can't even just throw a certain type of error in JavaScript because they just don't apply at all. And so this might be available, and I know for sure that it's available in a bunch of different languages that you all will have used. But in JavaScript, you just get the error object, and you can pretty much just throw like the classic default like error type. And that's not specifically helpful, right? And so I'm finding that the string, the error strings that I wrote are coming up and bubbling up to users, not just developers. So if someone's using the 3D printer and they see an error that I wrote, I was never intending for users to see that error. And I only intended uh, AVR Girl to be used by like the development community. And so that was a huge surprise for me. Uh, and recently, um, Arduino, the company, have been dabbling and testing out using Aviago as a possible solution to allow um, robotic stuff to, and Arduino stuff to happen on Chromebooks. And so I thought, OK, that needs to be much more useful errors. So normally, when you throw a generic error in JavaScript, it's just the name of it is error, right? And again, that's super generic, and people can't look at it. And you shouldn't really regex against the error strings because they can change at any time, and that's really fragile for people, right? And so something that I've been working on recently is actually trying to uh, shim in JavaScript to have things that most other languages have, which is an actual error name or an error type that you can um, throw. And so thankfully, because JavaScript has the prototype chain um, model, we can just kind of extend that. Um, where the message can be the exact same thing, but we can have this uh, idea of trying to create an, a proper error name, right? And so if you have board not found error, that's much more useful for developers to use when they're implementing AVR Girl in um, their apps that users are using who don't have any technical knowledge. And so you can do that really simply. You can just do object.create error.prototype, and then you can start um, creating like a custom um, error object that can take a name and be overridden with that name. And so that's what I'm working on at the moment. I'm hoping to release it soon. And I did a YouTube video on this a very long time ago when I started writing it. Um, I have a Twitch stream that I do every Sunday where I just live program on open source um, for a couple of hours, and people can watch that. And so if you're interested in just kind of learning a little bit about the library that I write and what it's like trying to create helpful errors in JavaScript, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash c slash noopcat. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. And if you feel like joining in on Sunday at 11 a.m. US EST time, then I would love to see you. I will not be online this weekend because I'm here, but the weekend after. Cool, so what are the other advantages to actually creating these errors, which seems so obvious to a lot of you with, uh, with, who use, um, I guess, like more helpful languages when it comes to this? Well, this means that it's internationalization or I18N friendly. And so you, you don't just have to stick with my English strings. People can have a look at what type of error it is, and then they can write their own error messages. And they can also just create things that are a bit more friendly than like Uno not found. It can be something like, hey, we couldn't find your 3D printer. Maybe just push the reset button or plug it in and out. Or like, you know, have you tried turning it on and off again and things like that. And that's way better than my robotic error messages that I only intended developers to see. Um, no more dodgy string regexes, as I said, just to be able to change that in the first place. And it also shows thought for the developer. It's just a nice thing to do. So the lesson here is think about your users, um, which, are, which are your developers, but also think about your users' users. Because I, I just did not even think that, that like, non-technical or non-developer users would even see these error messages. And so I just felt so ignorant when I realized, of course, like, maybe I just didn't think anyone was going to use my software, and that was very surprising. And then developers are going to love you so much because you just made their job so much easier, and it's just such a small thing. Cool. So case study four, community. This one um, has inspired me a lot, and it's about like a larger community, and it's, it's a smaller one within the Node bot subset. 
And that's the TESOL project, which I touched on really briefly in the intro. So the TESOL um, project was a, like a, a private company, and then they ended up disbanding into like an open source hardware um, project that is, I think it's part of the jQuery Foundation now, and it's, all of their stuff is open source. Um, they've produced two different microcontrollers right now, and it's a really wonderful out-of-the-box experience because you essentially write your JavaScript on the computer, and then you can use Wi-Fi or USB, it doesn't really matter, to just run a, CL they have a really great CLI, you run like TESOL, TESOL upload, and then it just like zips up all your stuff, sends it over the wire, and then boots it up on your TESOL, and it takes like less than a minute to do that. Um, it's very, very fast. And so you can just write stuff, and, and you know, in the time it takes for you to build something in Visual Studio, like it's done, and that's really impressive. And just using native JavaScript without having this weird, like, formata tethering situation um, allows the Tesla to be much more advanced because it runs a much more powerful chip uh, than a standard Arduino, which is like an AVR, um, I think, 8 megahertz chip. This runs like an ARM chip that can actually run Linux on it. So the Tesla runs OpenWRT. Uh, which means you can actually set it up as a router access point, which is even cooler. Uh, so I have a friend called um, Hipster Brown on, uh, on Twitter. It's Nick Herr, and he's kind of doing a lot of the access point stuff, and he's doing some cool stuff with it. And so this is the, what the second version, the Tesla 2, looks like. And so you've got your standard kind of, if you've used an Arduino before, you plug all the things into the pins. Uh, it has a network port, but it also has a bunch of USB ports, which is really, really handy. And you can see along the side there, that's kind of like the wireless, um, the wireless copper exposed. And so Tesla have this open governance model, and I found it really super interesting when I joined them. And so you kind of have this, the entire Tesla community at large, right? And then it kind of like, the rings get smaller and smaller. Then you have contributors, who are those who just like contributing to the libraries and fixing bugs and things like that. Um, contributors move very quickly to be um, team members if they're kind of showing a lot of value to the project. And so I'm sort of the, the reddish, brownish, sort of oko ring in there. And then right in the middle you have the steering committee. And so the, they have um, weekly updates about their stuff. They run meetings and report back on them. Um, everything is, is open source, and it's very clear how you can contribute to the model. And I just really liked this because I don't see this in hardware ever. You know, so much hardware stuff is, is very commercial, very enterprisey, very, like, insular, very, like, secretive, you know, and Tesla just don't have any secrets like that, and it's very clear how you can contribute and how you can become a member of their community. And I just thought that that was really inspiring and that's something that we could do um, in general in, in the open source community, even outside hardware, to help people get started in open source. It's really scary and intimidating for people. And I remember my first public pull request, my heart was pounding and I was like, they're gonna hate it and they're gonna close it or they'll merge it because they feel sorry for me and I just freaked out about it. This helps a lot, having this transparency. They also have clearly defined community goals every year, and so their latest goal is to grow the community, to increase contributions, and encourage both inclusion and accessibility to newcomers. That to me is like, it's just node bots, that's exactly what the community started, and so it's wonderful to see them continuing that within their ecosystem, which in my opinion is an even better experience than just like a lot of the node bot stuff out of the box. They also want to support and grow the number of production deployments of Tesla in the field. They've seen Tesla's being used in factories to monitor stuff with sensors, and so even though microcontrollers or breakout boards are considered just for hobby use, the Tesla is like reasonably affordable, and if you only need to dispatch a few in a factory, there's no point in developing your own cheaper board, right? Like when you only have to deploy them once in each factory and you can update them over the air. And so they're seeing a lot of really positive like production uses where that's very atypical of this industry as well, and I think that's awesome. They also have an event called Meet the Tessellators, um, which is a really, really cute name for their community. We're all Tessellators. And so this is in New York at a, a co-working space, and um, a few people had already left for the day, so there were more than this, but 
uh, a bunch of us got together and tried to all spend the day contributing to the Tesla project. And so I was debugging a weird issue where um, some of the kind of breakout boards that you can connect to the Tesla, one of the boards just wouldn't update the firmware. And so I was trying to see if AVR Girl could help solve that issue. And a lot of other people just tried to make example projects so that they could improve the documentation on the site, which documentation super, super important. Um, and I didn't have a case study for that today, but I still think that's one of the most important things you can do for other developers. And so all of these people here are developers. Um, the main two ringleaders of Tesla uh, are at the front. Uh, it's John and Kelsey, and um, there's Tim and Flucky and Nick Hipster Brown, and that's a really cool group. So that was just really nice having them come to New York because everyone's kind of spread throughout the world instead of just in one place. So meeting in person was just a really great experience. So the lesson that I took from um, the Tesla 2 project is that community improves your product, especially, especially in open source. But if you are enterprise and you still have open source stuff, get your community excited about your stuff and support them. Because you can't buy community, like you can't just throw money at people, that's not how it works, like you can only own it. And so be authentic, go out there, find your people, find your contributors, try and reward them. Um, just like make people feel that they're valuable. And they'll do that face, and I love that face. Super cute. So bringing it all together, I'm just gonna sum everything up. Um, this is my opinion, it's obviously not a takeaway from this talk, but I think that JavaScript rocks for robots, and we've seen that year after year after year. And so if you haven't already looked at that and you wanna get into hardware, or if you've just been kind of doing stuff a, a different way to that, I would encourage you to look into it. Um, you can go to nodebots.io or just Google nodebots, and you'll get a ton of resources. Um, treat your peers like regular users. This is definitely the biggest point that I wanna make. With users, we tend to hold their hands a little bit more, and I don't think that that's condescending to do that for our developer peers. You, you can't just throw them in the deep end with like very terse documentation and expect them to dig through your test examples just to see how to use your library. Um, if you do give them errors and things like that, try to sort of take a leaf out of the Elm languages book and provide really helpful syntax errors and things like that. There are just so many things you can do even if your library is very simple and doesn't do a lot, there's, there's just a ton of stuff you can do to help people because developers are coming in to use your software at all different um, skill levels, and again, they're gonna blame themselves first, and maybe it was us, not them. So a big part of that is not to assume knowledge, and so always assume that um, someone coming in, let's say, like, my, my library AVR girl is, people kind of stumble across it, and they might not have used Node.js before. And so even in my instructions in my documentation, I say things like, if you haven't already installed Node.js, because a lot of people will just run npm install in their, in their command line, and they're like, the command didn't work, and then they're stuck, and then they're like, okay, what's npm? Oh, okay, what's Node.js? And so instead, just like give them directions. Like, just go back one or two steps further than you probably assume you need to, and that's probably a good rule of thumb. Provide first-class support. Um, just don't assume that someone is, is doing something silly with your code and don't judge them. Just start asking them questions and see whether or not you can make um, the, the error reporting much easier to do. Um, and contributions over complaints. We do a lot of complaining. It's very easy to open issue and say, your thing sucks, it doesn't work. But encouraging a community where it's much more fun, exciting, even if it takes a bit longer, to open a pull request and then be part of the project. Fostering a, a, like a, an attitude of contributions over complaints, I just love that so much. And I forget where I heard that from, but I just think that that's a really good way of thinking about it. You can complain all you want, but it doesn't actually get the issue fixed. And always ask yourself, at the end of the day, uh, for my final point, when you're writing software, whether it's for users or for developers, always ask yourself, where can I delight? And that's it, thank you. We have a little bit of time for questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. That's a really good question. 
So the question was, can you get that Sumo Bot kit still? Um, you know, does it come as a kit and is it available to buy? Uh, it's not available to buy just because us as a community just don't have the um, don't have the the resources to kind of like sell that online and be active with it. Um, but I think you can just Google Sumo Bot, and the the actual kit is open source. So you can go to the repo. You can actually get the laser. Oh, I'm not on the internet. You can get the laser cut files and you can actually kind of get them done. There are also um, kits that are pretty affordable that do the same thing. Um, and as long as you can mount an Arduino on it, you can make it into a node bot. Um, the Make JavaScript Robotics book has a, an example of a bot that's even cheaper to make than, than that Sumo bot. That Sumo bot costs around $50 US, which sounds like a lot, but it comes with the board and the USB cable and everything. Um, there's one called a Simple Bot in the Make JavaScript Robotics book, and it's just like one, you can actually make it out of cardboard, and it's a much simpler frame, and it's, it's really cool. So if you tweet at me, if you tweet at NoopCat, just asking me about the kit, I can, when I have internet, I can chase up that GitHub repo for you if you like. Cool. Anything else? Great. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.